So what am I arguing for in this slide? I'm arguing for a pressure far higher than the accepted value of Martian area rate, 6.1 millibars. Area rate on Mars is the equivalent of sea level on Earth. Now, sea level pressure on Earth is about 1,000 millibars, so compared to that, the 6.1 millibars is nearly a vacuum. Now, I have many reasons to actually question the pressure, which is why you looked into the Viking data in the first place. Here's a view from MiG-25 on Earth at 8, about 84,000 feet, where the pressure is about twice that of Mars area, where you notice that the sky is actually black. Next. Okay, initial stimulus for research, uh, dust devils. So on the left is a dust devil on Mars, and the right is a dust devil on Earth. Now, there are many similarities in between these. I'll delve into that later. The scope of the research was two years, a special topics course at the university, archive reviews, interviews of pressure designers, and the Viking data audit. And my original question was, how can a dust devil form in your vacuum? Well, the answer is that it probably can't. Next. Okay, NASA AIMS experiment. I mentioned this last year, for those of you who are over here. Um, Dust devils on Mars typically form with wind speeds around 6 meters per second. In this experiment, they tried to replicate them at 10 millibars, but to create them, they had to use a minimum wind speed of 70 meters per second, which is about a Category 5 hurricane. And they could not use a fan because the air was too tenuous, so they used a suction technique and they created the wrong phenomenon, the wrong wind speed. Okay, apparently, dust devils can form even more pressure, supposedly 1 millibar from top of our sea lines than that one up there. So that's one one thousand birth pressure at sea level, and NASA struggled to create these at 10 millibars, and they created the wrong thing there. On the right here is a diagram to Greece at all. An elevation scheme, as you can see, dust devils form up and down the mountain here, continuous. Um, they propose that the greenhouse and thermoprecious effect causes lifting of dust at the top after our photons do have momentum, so they can dislodge dust, but that does not explain any circulating motion. Um, furthermore, I don't know why you need a special effect if this is continuous up and down the mountain. Okay, next one. All right, dust filters. Why are these important? Well, every lander on Mars that had a meteorological package essentially had an air intake tube, a dust filter on that, on, on the other end, and then the pressure sensor directly behind that. So if these filters were to clog, what you would expect to see is a trap pocket of gas behind a dust plot whose pressure would vary only based on the temperature inside the lander. So why would I think these would fog? Well, first of all, the um, cross-section of the um, dust, dust, um, dust intake tubes are very small. If that were a dive surface area, the Viking landers would have a 40 square millimeter dot there. And Pathfinder, the internal diameter, internal area would be about 3.14, and the one of the Phoenix would be about 10. Very small, big dust. Next. Now, what would you expect if there were dust clouds? You would expect the Amy Sachs or Amundsen's law to apply, which applies for gas and acidic container and says that the pressure varies inversely with uh, temperature. So on the top graph here is the pressure in millibars for the Viking 2 for Martian year. On the very bottom here is a graph of the temperature. Now, at first, it doesn't look like I could possibly be right. And when the pressure goes up, the temperature curve is going down, which is not what you want to be seeing. But then, you have to recall the Viking landers have RTG heaters in them. So when it gets cold outside, the heaters will turn on inside the lander and thereby raise the pressure. Yeah, so when you invert the temperature profile here, you actually see the pressure goes up. So the hypothesis above annual trends will be matched at the hourly level when RTG heaters are on increasing pressure behind the dust clock. Appears to be fulfilled at first glance. So I'll proceed with the next one. Okay, this is another uh, superficial look at the idea of the data audit was more extensive. Basically, you take the lowest and highest temperatures measured by the Viking lander, the lowest pressure measured by the Viking lander, and then you attempt to use this law to predict the theoretical highest pressure you could possibly have if only this law were in effect and no ice cap phenomenon mattered. So what I get by doing that is about 9.4 millibars, and the actual pressure was about 9.57 millibars, so I got 98.19% of predicted value from using that method. Viking 2 year 2, you can't really see it was cut off, on the screen, that was only about 91%, and that was because the pressure gauges actually stuck several times. What do I mean by that? Essentially, the pressure measured by the lander would not change for, say, six days straight, regardless of the temperature changes. There are a couple of instances where that would occur, but when that's not in effect, I can predict the pressure is very accurately. Next. Okay, dust. Here's the uh, qualitative evidence for dust. This is the first photo from Mars from the Viking Moon lander. On the left of the screen, there's a dark band of <coughs> dust cloud. On the right, you can see dust from the lander pad as well as rocks from the lander pad. And it was stated in the really all, all paper of 92, 
in designing future lander spacecraft for Mars, consideration must be given to the infiltration of fine dust from the spacecraft components. So that's just one look at dust, but does it really matter? Next one. Well, it actually can. Dust storms, when they occur, can block out as much as 99% of incident light. This event actually happened on Earth locally in um, Phoenix, Arizona, here in Mount July. The pressure at Luke Air Force Base increased during the dust storm by 6.6 .6 millibars at least. I say at least because the measurements were taken about once every hour, so they may have missed the high point. But the point being is that that pressure increase is more than the whole entire Martian atmosphere area. And if you had a pressure sensor that could only measure up 12 millibars, you had an event similar to this, which is conceivable because Mars does have original little dust storms, that would take the 12 millibar sensors over their maximum range, even if I, I were wrong on the higher pressure. Okay, furthermore, the last four successful landers on Mars were downrange between 13.4 and 27 kilometers. NASA pursued the side requested help uh, actually for this, and uh, he postulated that about 50 kilometers elevation, the pressure is less, sorry, the air density is less by about 40 percent, and the surface is higher by about 5 percent. Conservation of atmosphere, but what he forgets to mention is there are actually three landers lost uh, since 1999: Border Lander, Deep Space Two, and Beagle Two. These may have been short landings. We don't necessarily know what happened to all of them. Okay. Also, the Pathfinder anemometers could not be calibrated. And last year, I noticed actually there were two types of anemometers. You have these dumbbell-shaped ones on the far left, and you have this variable wind sensor on the right. Both could not be calibrated, and you require an understanding of their density to cover these. The follow-up mission on the right of Phoenix had telltale. Wind speeds varied at about 22 miles an hour, could not be measured. So it just tell you that it must be worse than that, and maybe less than that, 20 to 40 percent increases. Okay, this is a sort of contradiction with the global circulation models, which are the weather trade system for Mars. The actual ice particles in the clouds are about two microns. The global circulation models, that air density, are all the predict particles between 20 and 30 microns. Okay, dust levels, I'm going to be comparing and contrasting them as well as showing you some more information on right now. They're driven by pressure differentials, and if you actually look at the pressure differentials measured on the landers, they're very, very tiny compared to other events like the, um, like the pressure spikes that we'll be showing later, which is kind of suspicious and probably indicates a clock dust over. Over 30 dust levels hit the Phoenix lander in about 100 days. So if something the size of a car I hit for roughly once every five days, and the Pathfinder can hit roughly about every day. Okay, seasons of formation, very similar in other Mars, both on the regional summer and spring on Mars. They both have electrical properties. The shape and size are similar, but on Mars they get Times wider and 10 times higher, and they both form around noon when there's peak solar resolution. Okay, I mentioned earlier the wind speed is about 6 meters a second over 13 miles an hour. The core temperature increase, which is the temperature difference in between the dust level, inside the dust level and the outside environment, can be as much as 10 Kelvin. However, higher sampling rates may reveal as much as 20 Kelvin in both lines. Mm -hmm. Dust particle size, uh, that is the dust that's being lifted on Mars, is usually about 1 micron. Well, the low pressure in the state of the Reed and Lewis um, Marshall Pond that we visited both in 2004 that you'd have to have a wind speed of 500 meters per second to lift the dust. So it's proposed that saltation where 80 micron plus or minus 10 micron particles are lifted, fall that down, and then train these smaller ones into the wind. Okay, more updated figures on the um, actual drops. The maximum pressure drop for a Mars dust at the Phoenix was 0 .02, about 0 0.029 millibars. At Pathfinder is about 0 0.048 millibars. Now those are very tiny. The um, Viking pressure spike I'll show you later, which occurs pretty much every single day at 7.30 local time, would increase pressure by about 0.6 millibars, as much as that, which is an order of magnitude higher than this, and that's from nothing, essentially. The weather's just sitting there. That's probably indicated of internal events. Comparison on, uh, comparison on Earth reveals in 1953 that dust level that went directly to microbarograph increased pressure by 1.354 millibars. So an event on Earth would be like 13 times greater pressure drop than a Pathfinder event and 21 times greater than a Phoenix event. This I want to briefly mention, um, scale height, it says that pressure dies off exponentially with height. It's derived from hydrostatic equilibrium and the ideal gas law. You can throw some intervals in there and you can get this relationship. It only works with constant temperature. If you don't have that unit temperature profile, which I don't happen to have one of those on me right now, Okay, so by scale height map, the pressure in our CMON should be about one millibar. 
which is the figure that NASA cites. However, if you use the same P naught, that is the atmospheric pressure, say aerial, you would expect to get the same answer because after all, this is just pulling each other and just very straightforward mix. Okay, I'm just going to show you a topographic map of Mars. Um, as you can see here, there's the Tarsus range, these three dots, this being our Mars. And the Lucas Mons is the dot up towards that. The gliders are shown here, they're all northerly, they're all in northern hemisphere or equatorial latitudes. And there are also many release points that are mentioned earlier today. Those are um, basically cross Polsky at all tend to believe that's a biological origin because methane has a lifespan of about 200 degrees in the atmosphere and more is geologically dead. But I will not be discussing that, maybe talking about our CMONs next. Okay, the spiral cloud formation on our sea lungs. Now, this looks like a hurricane-like formation with vigorous 10-kilometer eye walls. It's fairly periodic in formation, unique to the mountain. And these clouds extend about 15, 30 kilometers above the base of the mountain. So you take 17 kilometers and add that number to it. On a uh, 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 scale-like calculations indicate pressures on the order of tens to hundreds of millibars at the, those elevations. However, those are just rough ballpark estimates because I know there is an inversion layer in between there and those elevations, so that would throw this off a little bit. On Earth, there are those pressures that correspond to about 35 kilometers above sea level. Now, on Earth, the troposphere extends about from ground level to 12 to 20 kilometers, depending on where you are on the planet. That is where all weather is confined to primarily. Above that, you're going to see thin, wispy clouds or very tenuous formations. So this tends to indicate higher pressure because you should not see this phenomenon at that elevation. That would be like in the stratosphere, and that's not really what the weather is. Okay. Radio occultation. I noticed actually there are discrepancies in between the values that are reported now and those that were reported originally. As you can see here, old versus new. And these measurements are made many, many years ago. I mean, they just changed over time, apparently. How, how does radio occultation work? Basically, you send a radio wave through the atmosphere of Mars. And based on the index of diffraction, which will cause time delays and different angles of reflection will crash and other people. Hopefully be able to get something about pressure based on that because index of refraction is a function of very density. Okay, but it's also stated in the NASA report that occultation experiment indicated that atmospheric pressure at the surface of Mars range from 420 millibars or average 80 millibars estimated earlier. The 20 millibars is never found in any document I've seen. They always are about 10 millibars maximum. Furthermore, look at the date on this. This is after the this is around the time of Viking Landers, and they're still going to the 80 millibars estimated earlier. That's not an accepted figure, but I probably tend to think pressure is probably around there somewhere for higher. Okay, next. Uh, occultation, using the graph, um, these are all the occultation points from Mariner 9 orbiter. It missed the low and high points on Mars, our CMONs and Hell's Basin, but it did get the bonus mons, which is about 14 kilometers high, and it took a reading there. But it stated that it was based on pressure altitudes, which tends to make me believe they just measured the height of the mountain and they just use scale height to derive the pressure. Okay, landers. The only four landers could measure the pressure on the surface. None could measure about 18 millibars. The last two are limited to 12. Now, the MSL lander coming up should be about limited to about 11.5 millibars. So the range is going down over time. These ranges were based on radio occupation. All right, the first two sensors on Mars, the Vikings, 0 to 18 millibar range, and Pathfinder, 0 to 12. A sensor that can measure the Earth pressure was also altered, but supposedly a stay on Earth. Now, I found something interesting recently about this. The calibration for the Pathfinder sensor was actually done about two-thirds of the time at Earth pressure for some reason, which is not what they're expecting to see there. The other third of the time it was at Mars pressure, which is questionable as to why you need to calibrate Earth pressure if you don't believe pressure is your value. All right, next. Phoenix does a Phoenix pressure sensor. On the uh, left there, you see the air access tube. On the right, you can see there's a dust filter. And then this will be what it sort of looked like if there was a dust cloud. The FMI who built the sensor actually is dated. We should find out how the pressure tube is not in the spacecraft and if there are additional fluids, etc. Meaning that the people that built this sensor are said to did not know what happened to it after they left. And that was the ITAR, International Traffic Alarm Simulations, which prohibits the sharing of certain information. This is found in Taylor at all paper. After Phoenix landed, the actual thermal environment was worse than the worst expected case. Information on 
relocation of the heat source had not been provided initially due to high charge restrictions. Next. The Hong Kong an engineer who worked on the sensor stated that, that we at MI did not know how our sensors went on in the spacecraft and how many filters there were shows that the exchange of information between NASA and FAR and some subcontractors did not work out in this mission. So there was only supposed to be one filter, not multiple filters, and they didn't know what happened to the sensor, which tends to make me believe that it wouldn't work properly the program. Okay, um, these are the pressure curves over the years on Mars. Uh, would you expect 55% of the same days for four years straight to have the same pressure? Probably not, especially if the year's about twice as long as on Earth, but apparently that is what happened in the shaded regions here. These bottom curves, lighting one, top curves, lighting two. The uh, PX is superimposed on here to see the data, which it, it should if all the pressure access tubes plot in a similar manner. Alternatively, there are so few landers that actually measure pressure that it could be coincidence. Also, if you notice, it doesn't really appear to fit precisely. It looks like if you extrapolate this, it's just going to keep going down. It starts to lose the fit of the curve. Okay, spectroscopy. Um, supposedly, you can use this to measure pressure, but apparently it isn't that accurate one today. It doesn't work with ice clouds and the frost, uh, such as the poles, and pressure readings are only published for 90 days. You can see them a little bit here. Each of those uh, right axes is actually a data point. You can see this from the region. The curve there is a false curve. It's uh, an extrapolation based on this Viking curve here. It's shifted vertically. They don't have anything on the ground to actually measure pressure at that time. And the Deagle 2 lander, as mentioned earlier in today's presentation, and the nerve presentation was actually lost. It didn't land successfully next. Okay, based on this, you should think that. Occam's razor has two points. Um, one, entities must not be multiplied by all necessity, and two, the simple solution is usually the correct one. Based on this, you should think I should be wrong. Just ignore all the weather and all the other phenomena. Because all the lenders have consistent data, but that may only be because all the air access tubes plot in the same manner. Next. Why well, trash Occam's razor? Overall, if you actually look at the um, Amundsen's law I used, the you know, pressure is uh, very inverse, inverse proportion to ambient temperature and direct proportion required by RTGs to keep internal temperature stable. Furthermore, using a general pressure projection, I can predict the highest theoretical pressure on Mars to over 90% accuracy using the exact law and not the, the ice cap. Okay, the weather does not match your pressure values, dust levels, dust storms, and the gyro I showed you earlier. Know where to change your dust filters should they clog. The Viking data is suspicious because it's nearly an exact repeat over four years, and the model of the Viking data actually shows huge patterns of stuck pressures. Basically, you have a pressure curve that look like this, which is a horizontal line. So when you see the pressure curves earlier, that's not really a legitimate thing. Even though they use the cubic spline to interpolate some of the points, that doesn't justify taking the horizontal line and turning it into a curve. If you had higher pressure, you would expect there to be more drag. Handing the navigation sheet for MR on state at some points in the atmosphere, we saw a difference in atmospheric density by a factor of 1.3, which means there's 30% higher than the model, but around the South Pole, we saw an ecological scale factor of 4.5, so that means it was 350% off the model for the model. Okay, this is, this is a pressure spike due to a dust storm, the original one. In the upper atmosphere, pressure doubled in 48 hours, increased by a factor of 5.6 in four weeks. Okay, the anemometers could not be calibrated on that fire. The NHS had several design problems. And no pressure sensors could measure about 18 millibars the last two million years old. Also, any lander that had only a 12 millibar pressure capability, such as Phoenix and Pathfinder, if there were a dust storm like a Blue Air Force base, it would take it over the limit, even at pressure over 6 millibars at every limit. This is a very interesting fact here. That the environmental pressure masses of the TAP sensors, Viking and Pathfinder, do not match the Visalami Phoenix. Notice the difference in times there. That seems to be the curiosity. Also, around 7.30 local time every morning, the Viking 1 and 2 pretty much, pressure rose by as much as 10% of the Martian atmosphere area, 0.6 millibars or more if it were to go up in a single hour. Probable cause of RTG year, which is programmed to turn off periodic times. Okay, predictions. So we're going to do some of the new stuff here. Using this formula here, pressure equals the minimum pressure times the 255 Kelvin divided by temperature measured in the cell. I can predict the pressure using this gas law to within 2% wherever the blocks are shaded red. 
The temperatures are also really good. By the way, this um, column right here is actually where the pressure spike occurs pretty much daily. Over time throughout the year, this chart will shift around, which you would expect because the heaters when you turn on different times. Also, I'll leave you with this. That, uh, NASA Ames failed to simulate dust levels of 10 millibars of the appropriate wind advantage. So that's a flaw. Okay, please stay for part two, where my dad's actually going to go through the actual data so you can see more technical content. On the left here is Crater Lake, on the right is Vestidus Borealis, Crater on Mars. And both that lakes, the one on the right is frozen. And you might wonder, if I were right, you know, we're higher pressure, why don't we see water over Mars? Well, there are two reasons. One, it's too cold. And two, water is not really a constituent in the atmosphere. It's a minor gas, like argon is on Earth. It's a very small constituent in the atmosphere. Any questions? Um, so what would you say, what do you feel the actual pressure on Mars is? I'm thinking about at least an order of magnitude. Hopefully what I would like to see is what's the minimum pressure required for dust level formation of that pressure, but I haven't been able to do this limitation on that. But you feel that I mean, having double the pumpage pressure is quite reasonable? Double? I think that's too, too low, so... I mean, the issue I have is if you see dust levels at 1 millibar and you double the grade of 10 millibars, I mean, even if you double the pressure, that would just be saying it's 2 millibars at the top of our same models, and you're still having dust level. You mentioned an RTG. Uh, could there be um, a local pressure rise to uh, the RTG outgassing contaminants? Or do you see a correlation like that? Basically, what I see the RTG's function as is it, it will increase the temperature inside the lander because there's a dust clot and that will just raise the pressure. I mean, it's, it's fairly periodic. I mean, nothing should be that periodic unless it's pre programmed into the system to just turn on all that time. Shouldn't it be possible to do a simple kinetic uh, calculation using normal physical principles to determine whether that rarity of, of, of atmosphere at a given velocity could create a dust level? I think that would be a fairly straightforward calculation. Just, maybe that's what I'm done. I don't know. I asked actually what the question is about that. I think you said it would be a numerical thing you have to really program a lot. But of course, experimentation is probably better. Anything else? Uh, okay. You may get some of your questions answered in on part two okay. with the data on it. If, if the pressure is a lot higher than expected, um, wouldn't the various landers have landed far short of their expected impact? Let me answer that. If the lander angle was a bit shallow, it would actually skip off a bit and go further. Furthermore, I have to remember that, almost, that no other country actually put a lander on the surface of Mars successfully except the U.S. Russia tried many times. The best they could do was one of their landers last for 15 seconds and then broke. And as mentioned earlier today, also the U.S. landing record is not exactly great here. Yeah, NASA's pursued the side and they put out this call for help because four landers have landed long, which normally indicates what you're talking about, less pressure. Uh, overlook the fact that three landers were lost. And so this morning I asked a question you know, uh, with uh, Beagle. Did they have any, did they actually find it from the surface of Mars? Because, you know, we heard something about there was 40% less pressure, and that's, that's pursued the size idea. And he's the guy who was in charge of the landings on Mars. You know, he says 40 percent less than 50 kilometers, 5 percent less, I mean, more down on the surface over there. So I think that was an assumption. Oh, it must have been that there was less air, and therefore, you know, it landed longer again. But if it came in at a little steeper angle and put more of that air, which happened with MRO and, and uh, Mars Global Surveyor, you know, both of those felt more air than they're supposed to, had more air breaking going on. So if that's the case, then it would have come down short and it would have crashed there. So we need a little more data, a little more information. And, you know, we're only getting half the story when we look at those that go long. We have to understand exactly what happens to those that land short. Okay, uh, so anyway, my son is a senior at Emeritus Aeronautical University, and uh, he's only 18. And he's getting his BS in space physics uh, this December, he'll still be 18. Uh, so while he was busting his butt, you know, all these hard courses and everything like that, I figured that uh, after he wrote the initial paper last year, I would help him out. Uh, and I would help him perform an audit of the 
wasting the data and see was it really as good as it was supposed to be? How dare we challenge Viking data? You know, after all these times, everybody has been genuflecting to this data all these years, this must be what it is. And so we're going to see what the truth is from this presentation, I, I hope. Why well, focus on the two Viking landers? Well, it was only recently that the, uh, the partial Viking project data was made available to the public. It was pretty much held, you know, in a certain Ivory Tower someplace for a long time. There's a link here that, you know, takes you to uh, Professor James Tillman's uh, site, which has, uh, which that was the Viking project over there, and they've got all this data there. Uh, there were no other landers that were available to take pressure readings for such a long period of time. Now, although Viking 1 was on the surface for four years taking, taking measurements, what's posted on uh, Professor Tillman's site was only solves 1 to 350 minus phase 117 and 133. For Viking 2, he had solves 1 to 1,050. So you have about almost 1,400 uh, days, Martian days worth of pressure. With the pressure and the temperatures and the winds and everything else given every single hour. So what we've done in the last year is we've gone hour by hour through this data to see what's going on on an hourly basis. Does the data stand up when we really had a look at it? Compared to the other landers that were supposed to be able to measure pressure, Pathfinder, just a few months, July 4th and 97th to September 27th, only data for pressure for 26 solves. Most important to understand, the first solves pressure data is missing. And that is the critical time, folks, because that's when we're saying that pressure transducer, that air intake, that tube clogged right on land. So we need the pressure at that time to see what's going on. They don't have it. They're missing some other dates. Come back to that later. The Phoenix, May 25th to, uh, to November 10th, we see there was a very different pattern there. Whereas on the Vikings, where the temperature goes down, the pressure goes up because you think the heater's going on. There was no heater on the Phoenix. So what do you expect then? The temperature goes down, the pressure's going to go down. That's exactly what we saw. A linear shot down as it got colder over there. And that's in the report. Uh, only Viking 2 uh, provided the published data again for more than a year. So my son went over this before, you know, when the temperature went down the Vikings, the, the pressure went up. We flipped this bottom the chart over here to see how close these two curves were, and they were pretty close. So we had the hypothesis that, all right, this is an annual trend. This is solves zero to a thousand. So we said, we think that if it's the RTGs that are, are guilty here, and the pressure clock is guilty, that we're going to see this pattern on an hourly basis you know, uh, for the Vikings over there. Uh, and that's, in fact, what we found. Go ahead. So we had four problems with the Vikings and the pressures. Uh, one of the first ones that, that we noticed when we went through the data was there were pressure spikes at the same time every day. Same time. Now, we mentioned the 7.30 time in the morning. It's the 0.3 time bit. And I'll show you the Mars clock a little bit. So that's what we noticed first. But we sort of noticed as we went through this mass of data that there were other times of day that also they were, they were good. We were making, we were seeing the pressure spikes and seeing things that we were, seemed to be able to make some pretty good predictions over there. We didn't, we had to really get the data analyzed the right way after my son transferred all the data to a, by, by a MATLAB program before he could actually see what was going on. So the, the pressure was often stuck for up to six days at a time while the temperature was never stuck. Unless once in a while it was recorded as absolute zero. But other than that, we had pretty good temperature data. We did not have good pressure data the way we expected. And we found that there was a 0 0.09 millibar uh, change in pressure limitation that could be reported by the Vikings through the data digitization. So there were smaller pressure changes that are published on, uh, on Tillman's Viking project site. But they're there by what's supposed to be a cubic spline technique, which he says right there that they don't explain what it is. You can look it up in the math book. But we saw times when clearly it wasn't justified to have a 0 0.01 increase or a point in, of one hour. And then the next hour, it's a 0 0.01 decrease. There's nothing in between. You know, there was no reason to justify that. Next. This is the Mars timing clock that we were working with. And this is, you know, basically showing what we found on Tillman's uh, site. Uh, the time bits down here, 0 0.02, 0 0.06, 0 0.1, 0 0.14, 0 0.18. They increase by 0 0.04. And what they correspond to, if we take this over to the right side on a clock that we can all understand really easily, say Mars has approximately 25 hours a day. It's a little less than that. But basically, if you take 25 hours and you make them about 59 minute hours instead of 60 minute hours over here, then we start seeing some patterns. 
We look mostly at, at the time between what we correspond to 6.30 and 8.30 in the morning. The point six, two six to point that three, four time units. So that's where we got most of our data initially. But eventually we found that not only was there a pressure spike that was uh, very predictable at 7.30 in the morning, there was one at 2.30, there was one at 10.30, there was one at 4.30 in the afternoon, one at 11.30 at night. Next. This is the way the data looked on, on uh, Professor Tillman's site originally. So this is what we were stuck with. It was not anything that could be lifted easily into an Excel program or a Microsoft Works or anything like that. It was just going across each line. The year, the LS, you know, where the planet is around the sun, the sol, the wind speed, the wind direction, the pressure millibars, temperature Fahrenheit, temperature Celsius over there. So it just went on for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of rows. And to see patterns on that was not easy. So David developed the MATLAB, pro, uh, MATLAB program, and he extracted the data and gave it to me. But it still was months of work to put it onto Excel spreadsheets, you know, with all the columns, and then extract the data and look for, okay, we want to see exactly what happens at the 0.26 time in, the 0.3 time in, day after day. So for instance, on the original site, over here on SOL 331, and the 0.6 to the time in, which is 6.30 in the morning. The pressure was 8.78 millibars. Next hour, 0.3 time in, 7.30 in the morning goes up to 9.36 millibars. That's a 0.58 millibar increase. That's a big increase for Mars. Come one day later, we had to come down here. And so I had to come down and delete all this data, you know, and then come in and get to this. Same time in the morning. It goes from 0.874 to, to 9.36 millibars. That's that 0.62 millibar increase. So the idea was if there's something artificial about this data, if it's not ambient Martian pressure data, we are going to see the pressure increase every day because there's an internal event that is driving these pressures. It is not an external event. Surely, if there's some random weather coming through, one day there's a dust storm, next day it's a dust devil, next day it's clear whatever, we would see some difference, but we didn't see that difference. We saw on a regular basis the same things happening in the same hour, day after day after day after day. Next. So, Viking, uh, so this is our, our annexes one and annex two look like this. We took the data and we said, okay, what we're going to extract here, uh, Viking one uh, for annex A, here's solve 328, here's 329, 330, 331, 332, 333. And in between each one, I put a blue line. And so basically, we start looking. These are only for the 0.26, the 0.3, the 0.34 time minutes. So basically, uh, you know, 5.30, 6.30, 6.30, 7.30, 8.30 in the morning, 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, like that, all the way down. And particularly, I want to call your attention to these uh, columns over here, because we look then, what is the change in pressure? from the 0.26 to 0.3 time in, from 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning. And here it goes up one day by 0.46 millibars, the next day by 0.52, the next day by 0.58, next day by 0.58, the next day by 0.62, the next day by 0.51, the next day by 0.547. So that's over, this is solves 328 to 334 over here. And we did this for you know, 150 days or so. So we got a lot of data in here. What happened the next hour? Well, here it only went up by 0.01 millibars, which is less than the ability of the instrument to measure. And the next day, down by 0.01. Again, less than the ability of the instrument to measure. Next day, by, down by 0.05, down by 0.13, down by 0.11, down <coughs> by 0.03. Here it's up by 0.05. So uh, this is broken into days, you know, appendices that are like uh, 30, 50, 60, 60 solids long. I broke it up that way. This one was Appendix 5, and over those particular days that are in there, and in the first hour, it went up by 0.32 millibars. The second, it only went up by 0.02 millibars. It was quite noticeable. A lot of times it went down. Next. Okay, here you see what happens when we look at dust devils down here and compare them with the pressure increase over here at this 7.30 time. That's quite astounding. This pressure increased 0.62 millibars at that 7.30 time. All of these red bars down here represent dust devils that went over the pathfinders. So you would think it's a rather, rather dramatic event. You know, the dust devil is like a small tornado goes over the, over the pathfinder. You ought to see, that's pathfinder down here. This is, this is Viking over here. 
But you would think that the pressure is, you know, you get more of a pressure drop from a dust devil than a rise because it's 730 in the morning. 730 in the morning, we're saying is when the heater's coming on, it's not a weather phenomenon, it's an internal phenomenon. Next. So here, then we took all the data from 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning, those two time uh, times, and we graphed them. We want to see what's going on. Do they overlap? Do we have some time where it's going up a lot more in one hour than the other hour? Ah, yeah. This red line over here, this is basically 7.30 in the morning, all these points connecting it, and here we're looking at SOLS 200 to 350 in this data, 151 days data. The next line that come, the purple point lines over here connecting the points, that's the next hour. Notice we get down here, what happens? Very, very interesting. The pressure goes up at 7.30, comes down at 8.30. Up at 7.30, down at 8.30. Day after day after day after day after day, the same pattern. And it's almost like the heater comes on, okay, the pressure goes up, the heater turns off for the next hour, the pressure comes down. This did not look like a natural phenomenon. This look, this look looks like something's going on with the instrumentation here. So we begin to be, feel when we see this pattern, we got something here. Go ahead. So Annex C. Annex C, and we also noticed that when we started looking at the data, as like David mentioned before, you know, Viking 2 didn't do so good. You know, only 91% prediction versus 98% for the Viking 1. So <laughs> We look, okay, here's Viking 2, solid 639, zero pressure, uh -huh. bad data. Then the next day, okay, we start at that 0.86 time, which is 930 at night. What happens? Okay, temperatures are changing, minus 61, approximately, minus 65, minus 68, minus 71, we're minus 79, we're minus 56, minus 44. Who look at the pressures? Well, 8.08 millibars. Uh, it doesn't change. It goes one like that. Temperatures are changing, something's stuck. So if things are working somewhat, we're seeing this gay Lusak's law, you know, and we record this with uh, gas being here and heated in a certain container, you know, but then all of a sudden, I don't know whether somebody in NASA at 9 30 at night decides to turn it off because at this time is almost half the time it got stuck, about 47% of the time it got stuck. It got stuck at 9 30. Next. Uh, here we're looking at uh, Sol's. This is Viking 1. It says 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And we're looking over here at uh, the pressure here, 7.62 millibars all the way down. Here we see that on day uh, uh, Sol 6, change the pressure that day, uh, change the temperature from minus 55.42 to minus 85.64. Seeing a large change in temperature, we're not seeing change in pressure, 7.62. Next. Here we're looking at uh, Sol 6 down here mostly, but if it's a, if it's a tan, and if it's, it's this color, whenever you see that color in a column, this is what we try to do, try to colorize things so that that jumps out at you. Because it won't from Dr. Dead from Feldman's site, I guarantee it. This way, if it just starts, if it's that color, it's starting to get stuck at the 0.86 time in, which is 9.30 at night. That's why I chose that color. Half the time, almost, that's when it got stuck. Here, the temperature range, Minus 81.48 Celsius to minus 37.2 Celsius. No change in pressure. In this case, all 7.99 millibars. Go ahead. This David covered before, so I'm not going to repeat it again. Um, here we mentioned the fact that uh, the pressures, when they're reported, uh, they can only report a difference of 0.09 millibars. So we had 246 times they gave no pressure at all. But then the pressure started over here for at 7.38 millibars. And we had 305 of those, and we see over here 7.47, 7.56, 7.64. It keeps on increasing by 0.09 all the way down here. Notice that 969 times out of 3,517 hourly reports, it was exactly 7.47 millibars. Not a millibar, not a hundredth millibar more, not a hundredth millibar less. Go ahead, next. Okay, again. This data digitization. Here it's stuck for a long time at 8.08, and it gets stuck the next time. 7.99 is 0.09 millibars apart. And here we have the same pressure, change in temperature of 54.03 degrees Celsius. No change in pressure. I just can't believe that's true. Next. Alex D. You can idea how much work went in this thing. 
Um, the left side is one sow, one marching day. The right side is a different. They go on for uh, like 75 days this way, and then they start over and continue down. You see like 150 some odd days of that over here. And uh, what you're looking at is hour by hour over here. How well could we predict the pressure? And so the pressures that were measured are in the C column here, and in the H column, if the font is red, it means we were less than 2% off in our guess of what the pressure would be based on the formula that David gave you before. The pressure equals the minimum pressure that was seen, which was, what do we say, was 6.5 millibars times the maximum pressure, uh, temperature seen on, on Viking 1 was 255.17 Kelvin. Divided by the temperature in the cell, if we knew the temperature in the cell, we could within 2% of the time, at certain times a day, get that, get that, that pressure right. So like over here, we predicted uh, the pressure, the pressure was 7.49, we predicted 7.44, that was a half a percent off. And sometimes it gets a lot better than that. Here's a, and we predicted, 8.1, here it was 8.11 millibars, we, we predicted 8.107, rounds off to 8.11 millibars, using that formula. But why is there red and why is there black? The red is right, the black is not. Why is black not right? Black is not right because the heaters were off then. And so what we're getting into was how long did it take for that pressure transducer inside that dust pot? How long did it take for it to cool? And that's a function of insulation. We don't have the information on how good the insulation was. If we did, we probably could be a lot better. Now, a lot, a lot of these predictions, you know, hey, they might have been 3% off, but it was still black. Or 2.41% was still black. So we just put in red. But on these two, I have very different days. Saw 240, 240 and saw 315 down here. And they all start at, you know, just after midnight, 0.02, and they go down to 0.98. On these two days, if we look at that time, uh, we got red over here. Uh, so we were 1.34% off on Sol 240, and we come back on Sol 315, and we were 1.33% off on that day. So that's, that's a good ways down the pipe. We're still active at that time. Go next. Annex E focuses again on those two time dates, the 0.3 and 0.34, the 730 and 835 minutes for Viking 1 between Sol's 200 and 350. And in each case, what I did was only put uh, there's one day here, two said they uh, solved 212, here's 213, 214, 215, 216, and so forth. The first one of these lines, in each case, is going to be the 730 time, then, you know, the 0.3 time. Then. The second one is the 0.34 time, then, which is 830. So I want you to look at the colors in the far, final column over here and notice something. Because remember I told you red means we were better than 2%, less than 2% error. So it's the first hour is at 7.30. It goes red, black, 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 all the way down the page. All the way down the page. Two point, uh, from the top 212 to 224. And by the way, our, red, our blacks there weren't too, too, too far off. Uh, because that's still, you know, not too far after the heating in this particular case. I think we were off at the most, uh, like around 3.5% over there, something like that. Some of them were very, very close. Next. So this is like an EKG. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, right over here. At 0.14 times of the time, at 27.6% of the time, we're within 2% of the, of the correct prediction. Then we lose it down here, 0.22, like around 5:30 in the morning, down to one and a half percent prediction. Why? Why can't we predict? Again, the heater's been off. Now, 7:30 in the morning, the heater's got to come back on again. Because you think I don't wore off equipment. Hey, 27.7% accuracy. Next hour, down to 16.7%. Things are cooling off. Then it goes up again at 10 30 in the morning, 33.6% accuracy. And okay, the sun's up for a while, so we don't have to turn on the heater for a while. So it goes down. But I saw how many, but the 0.5 time minute is over here, that's about 18%. That's at noon. So in the early noon, there's still some good insulation, so they leave the heater off, and so our accuracy falls off. Now it starts at 10.30 at the diagonal pressure max, also at 30. That's right. That's right. So now what happens? In the late afternoon, the sun starts to get low on the horizon. 
Okay, turn the heater on again. You don't want to bring things to freeze up. So it goes up to 37.5% of the time we were right. And that's at 4.30 in the afternoon. And then it starts to fall off again until the evening. And then, and then when, you know, it's it, 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 it too cold at night. So the heater starts to come on and, you know, point, uh, point 0.9 full time then at like 11.30 at night. We're up there again at a pretty accurate uh, reading. Yeah. So it's, it's a very noticeable pattern. And we think this is definitely RTG kicking on at certain times. I asked Professor Tillman and other people give us the details on how the RTGs operate. Wouldn't do it. So we had to we had to derive by and we asked other people who like it too. What's going on with the RTGs? They wouldn't get close. So we said we'll derive we'll derive on our own this way. And that's what we did. Go ahead. So here this chart tells you again. When we were most accurate, when we were least accurate, 2.30, 7.30, 10.30, 11.30 in the morning, 4.30, 5.30, 11.30 at night, all fairly good uh, amounts of time that uh, we could predict within 2%, bottom of the 3%, and these are the 2%. Least accurate times on the right, 3.30, 4.30, 5.30 in the morning, 8.30 in the morning, 1.30, 2.30 in the afternoon, and 6.30 at night. Go ahead. So, then the, the idea was, okay, we have to find some way to show, to really visual, get a visual out there. How good are these predictions? So as my son said, this column here, this is the 0 0.3 time bit over here. This one goes between solves 228 and 250. And so all the way down here, we're within 2%. But there are other, and each one of these red blocks means, bingo, we, we nailed it. But uh, you see that we nailed it in the morning around that time, and then we start to nail it later in the afternoon, uh, and in between, we don't think that that's, uh, the heaters were on over there. But it varied from season to season slowly. That's how slowly. Here you see how slowly. Because <laughs> this is a lot of work to lay this out. Okay, the first graph over here, and you can all read all these in nice big detail on, on the site uh, in uh, Annex F. The report, but this is solves one, uh, one to twenty-seven, so we're in the summer. Here, one uh, twenty-eight to fifty-four, we're in the summer. Fifty-five to eighty-one, we start to get a little later. Eighty-two to one hundred six, and it starts, starts to be our agreements are in the middle of the day. Next time, next slide. Okay, we have data. You know, basically mostly a midday type thing. I'm not too sure what was going on with the RTGs earlier on. But there, there was a break in data here between solids 116 and 134. 147 to 173 down here, it starts to separate again, 174 to 200 like this. Now, I'm looking, the first day of fall was over here. I actually marked that, uh, the Martian uh, equinox over there. So here's solids 201 to 227. We start to see more success in the evenings. Go ahead, move the next And now we really start to have a lot of accurate predictions. As we move towards the winter, which starts over here, between the solves 228 and 350 down here, uh, we get a lot of the point threes. This is all point threes all the way down here. Point three times. This is all 7:30 in the morning over here. But when they turn it on, is a function again of when the sun comes up. We think. So that's what we were able to find. We were able to demonstrate that. Got the next. Again, with the pathfinder. We hope to get some good pressure there, and we found that the, the, they only had the, the pressures between basically solves 2 and 30. Uh, one the critical day was missing, so was 8, so was uh, 11, so was 7 days, yeah, 7 was missing. Their excuse was, was uh, various spacecraft software reset and download and downloading problems. Next. Uh, the question came up as to what did we actually send to Mars? What sensor went up there? It was not an easy question to answer. Because everybody we asked who was historically connected with us gave us a different answer. But we know that there was a P4 sensor that was selected, or a P4A. This one shows a P4A being ordered over here. Minimum pressure range from 0.1 psi to maximum 100 psi. And you know, 0.2 psi was on this one, it says it was ordered, which equates to 13.79 millibars. Now, I think there's a possibility here somebody may have pulled the wrong sensor. That's one small possibility because it's easy to confuse, especially if you're not the right person. P4 
PSI and dual bars, you know, depending on what you're looking for. Go ahead. Maybe we got it in the place. So this, we asked Tavis, send us the CADs. Send us the blueprint. What did you send to Mars on Viking? This is what they sent me. Before a says down here, there's an S after that. I thought that was a serial number originally. Maybe it means it was classified at some point. But there were two Tavis dash numbers on this. The first one went to point 36 PSIA, which was 0 to 24.82 millibars, so it was like a 25 millibar sensor. The second Tavis dash number over here read 0.1 PSIA, which went only to 6.9 millibars. Neither of them were what we were told went to Mars or the Vikings, which was 18 millibars. Go ahead. With, with the Pathfinder, it got even stranger. My son mentioned the fact that there was a sensor ordered from Tavis they could see Earth pressures. Okay, this is it right here. They sent us this, and the first one there said 0 to 15 PSIA, which is 0 to 1,034 millibars. That can see pressure outside your Earth. So if somebody, mistake is one thing, wanted to calibrate something on Earth is one thing. They had some other reason to send the sensor that could see Earth pressures. It was ordered. The second sensor was 0 to 12 millibars, 0 to, uh, one, uh, to 0 0.174 PSI as Tavis dash 2, 2 on that. So that's what the normal figure is that people give for the pathfinder. It was 12 millibars that was supposed to go up there. But they did have another sensor that could see something else. Go ahead. Now, this is supposed to be the Bible in terms of what went to Mars. This missile report published in March 1977 actually tested the sensors after <coughs> they were en route to Mars, not before, after. And this one in the abstract says two variable reluctance type pressure sensors with a full range of 1.79 times 10 to the third newtons per meter square, which is 18 millibars. That's what they tested. That's what they said they said, 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 said to Mars. Here the temperature range was interesting. Minus 28.89 Celsius plus 71.11 Celsius. Well, I already showed you the temperatures. It gets a hell of a lot colder than minus 28. We were saying minus 80s. And in fact, in this full report, which is 100 some pages, they showed that when it got down by mistake to a temperature that was like 60 degrees too cold, the things seemed to break. But then Professor Tillman told me they have RTGs, not to worry. It'll keep the temperatures warm and cozy. Yes? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. We're almost the next last slide, so we're doing good. Okay, attempted landings on Mars. Hard to get landings right if you don't understand the pressure. So up to the Viking one, three Soviet failures, the two Viking successes. What happened after the Vikings? Well, four attempts to land. Four successes, every one of them downrange. Three failures, we don't know why, loss, maybe short. But if you don't know the pressure right on Mars, you're going to screw up. Next. Finally, in calibration issues with Pathfinder, uh, we just uh, found this last week. And we found that, as David mentioned, that this goes on 30 some pages in here. Uh, it was not in this order originally. We put all of the pressure, the pressure calibration attempts that were 1,015 millibars, which is Earth pressure. That's what all of these are over here, and it goes on and on and on and on and on in the left column. And then they have various wind speeds and fan speeds and so forth. They're trying to calibrate the anemometer. The right column that I put in, in orange over here, that's Mars type pressures. The pressures that they uh, that they calibrated the thing at were between 14. 15.1 millibars. Supposedly nothing down close to what the actual pressure was supposed to be there with the Pathfinder land because of the difference in weight between carbon dioxide and, and earth air. That's why they chose a little higher pressure over there. But they did not make any attempt at all to calibrate these, these devices, these atomometers, based on maybe the pressure somewhere in between. And they depended on one thing, which they, ne they never did calibrate the atomometers in the end. But what they were hoping to do was to look at the transducer, the pressures, and then go back on that and say how much of the thing did the, the angle deflect on the, these little wind socks and so forth. But if the pressure sensor was broken because it jammed or landing, couldn't do it. In fact, they couldn't do it. Next, I think that's uh, this is the last slide. Conclusions and recommendations. 
The hypothesis that the annual trend with higher pressures measured at colder temperatures would be matched on an hourly basis for Viking 1 and Viking 2, when the RTGs were likely to be on, was supported. It is likely that the air access tubes and dust filters fog the landing and that pressure measurements were corrupted from then on. We've been working with the wrong pressure all these years. NASA and JPL should immediately study the full report. It's found on the line over here. If there are anybody, anybody from NASA here, we have some of these reports that we have, you know, have got the, uh, the CDs, but it's all available on David's site. Should study this and should make appropriate adjustments to pressure range sensitivity before launch of the MSL. We send it up with 11.5 millibar, uh, millibar max pressure. And just the, uh, just the dust storm can increase the pressure by 6.6. It ain't going to cut. This is not going to cut. So finally, a mean should be found in clear transducer air access tubes and to change the dust filters, just like you would for your air pollution. Thank you very much.